I bet some of you are scared seeing me hold a microphone as my history with held microphones is not the best, but this is a new microphone and a new audio recorder with new knowledge from both my dad and my best friend. So hopefully I figured it out. I don't doubt that I personally could still find a way to mess it up even with their help, but we're rolling with it. I just feel that with videos like this, I want to be holding something and you're not here to hold my hand. So this is the next best thing. Yes, I, Lovely Lore, was asked to be a cult leader. It was a failed marketing strategy by a particular company. I will get into it. At the time, the person behind it was facing a lot of backlash and I didn't really want to bring more attention to it. But I feel like now enough time has passed, the dust has settled, that hopefully we can take a look at it and see where it went wrong and also just the entertainment value behind it because I find it really funny. But not funny, haha. -ha funny weird. With this video, I'm probably going to burn every bridge with the sewing community within Lolita fashion because before we get to the cult stuff, I want to tell you about that time that Simplicity stole designs from Lolita brands. This video was sponsored by Scentbird. I have always enjoyed perfumes and changing my scents frequently, but that can be really expensive when you are buying large bottles, which is why I am so grateful for Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service and you choose a new design designer fragrance to try out every month for just $17. You get exactly what you want and choose with no unwanted surprises. The bottles that you receive are not tiny samples either, they are a full 30 day supply of perfume. You can use them within their protective locking case or take it out very easily and spray at ease. There are over 600 designer brands to choose from, perfumes, colognes, and unisex options to Scentbird stocks designer brands like Prada, Gucci, and Versace plus indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel. Last time I worked with Scentbird, I was really enjoying Prada Candy as well as Parfums de Marly, which I'm still enjoying. I still have quite a bit left of both of these. I have found Parfums de Marly Delina to be a lovely everyday scent with sweet Turkish rose giving a very soft powdery vibe. This month I have been trying out Brown Girl Jane Casablanca because I really wanted an elevated marshmallow scent. I really enjoy marshmallows and sweet things but I find that a lot of body sprays they smell too sickly sweet. The notes of Cardamom, Glowing Amber, Vanilla Orchid definitely balance out the marshmallow with this sweet but warm smooth scent and I really enjoy it. I was also really interested in trying Love Me by Toos because the original bottle looks like a bear. <laughs> but also I really enjoy peony scents and lychee, but I absolutely cannot stand jasmine. So I was curious if I would not like this scent because of that. Jasmine on its own to me, it feels like it's just very polleny and I associate it with sticky and bees. But the combination of peony, cedar wood, jasmine, none of the notes overpower each other. It smells fruity and fresh and flowery. It smells like those scents are being sifted through wood. The wood really smooths it all out. When I'm smelling it, I'm visualizing Degas. So this scent smells like 19th century impressionism. <laughs> If you try any scents from Sunbird, I'd love to know what your brain visualizes as you're smelling them. <laughs> Make sure to click the link below and use my code LOVELYLORE for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. That's only $8 for your first month. Scentbird is available to my fellow Canadians. Thank you so much Scentbird for continuing to support my content. The year 2015. The event, RuffleCon, in Connecticut. RuffleCon was an alternative fashion convention that ran from 2014 to 2017, and it featured a lot of Lolita representation, though it wasn't specifically just a Lolita event. It looks like the event was so much fun, but unfortunately I was never able to attend myself because it took place during October, which is when I work my haunt job and I can't take any time off. But it was covered by a lot of different people. There are many videos of the various events throughout the years. And Amy Bob actually has a full deep dive on the history of RuffleCon. Simplicity seems to have attended in 2015. There is video on their page 
from their fashion show and the things that they debuted in that fashion show were not exactly Lolita. They seem to be more like costume designs that were inspired by historical fashion and I want to be super nice to the models that are depicted here because we don't know that they chose to be in this a lot of the times when you apply to be a model at a convention you just apply for the show in general you don't get to choose which brand that you wear and you are placed it's different at some other conventions sometimes you do apply just for the brand so we don't know and these people may have wanted to model for triple fortune or hanuli and get stuck with simplicity at the time so i want you to be so so nice to these models even one of them while being interviewed mentions that what they are wearing is lolita fashion inspired today i'm wearing a lolita inspired outfit it's super cute and girly it's got lots of ruffles and bows which is right up my alley <laughs> but again the event was alternative fashion so it is okay that it's not exactly lolita simplicity now has about four different pattern designs that look like they are inspired by lolita fashion Fashion, but the ones in particular that the Lolita community has beef with is 8444 and the accessory pattern 8443. Now, if you've heard this story before, you might be familiar with the version that I heard, which was that Simplicity purchased angelic pretty dresses at RuffleCon and took them apart and then created patterns based off of those dresses. There's a couple things that don't add up about this theory. From the research that I have done, it doesn't seem that Angelic Pretty was even there. They were not listed as a guest vendor or sponsor for RuffleCon that year. It is possible that there may have been a Lolita swap meet where people were selling secondhand pieces and Simplicity obtained Angelic Pretty dresses from there. Also, the Lolita Collective is there. They may have had some secondhand angelic pretty dresses. I can't find any substantial evidence that the actual dress pattern itself was stolen from anything. A confirmed issue with 8444 was that the fabric used in order to market this pattern was purchased from Espresso Bug, formerly Hazel Bug, on Spoonflower, and they did not agree for their fabric to be used in this way. According to Lolita Tips Tumblr, the designer of the fabric made this statement. My intent was to give people the freedom to sell objects made with the fabric they bought from my Spoonflower page, not being used in an advertisement for a pattern. I feel like a painter who has had their artwork hung up in a very inappropriate place. Simplicity didn't credit the designer or where the fabric was from. The pattern is really cute. It's called Macaron Candy Shop and it is still available along with other adorable designs by Espresso Bug. So if you are looking for fabric to make Lolita dresses out of, I really recommend this one. This means that the actual dress pattern itself and all of the pieces in it are not conclusively stolen from anything as of 2023 as of this research if anyone comes forward and claims that these dresses were stolen from them they have evidence of that i will make an updated video i will post about it everywhere but it seems like they weren't actually stolen and this is just a rumor that went out of control the next claims that the lita community has against simplicity for their patterns is with accessory pattern 8443 which interestingly enough right now i could not find on simplicity's website so it's possible that uh this drama around it caused them to stop selling it the complaints were with two bonnets in this accessory pattern i got a little bit tongue-tied with words in this part so i'm going to re-explain miss candy holic claims that their bear bonnet was purchased by someone from simplicity at rufflecon and that this bear ear pattern was made based off of that bear ear bonnet that was purchased. Attendees of RuffleCon also reported seeing Simplicity purchasing a bonnet from Verge Vampire that has cat ears and claimed that this pattern is based off of that bonnet. This caused a significant amount of backlash and caused Simplicity to be allegedly banned from attending RuffleCon in the following years. Now, I'm not into my opinions on this yet. I am still stating information that I have found. 
So I bet a lot of you, when I say this next section, are going to be typing angry comments. Just know that I am explaining the information that I found. I'm not giving my opinions yet. I will make it perfectly clear when I am actually giving my opinions on this whole situation. It turns out it's very difficult to copyright a sewing pattern or a clothing item piece. You can't stop anyone from selling a clothing item that looks very similar to something that you have created. It's also common common practice in the fashion industry to purchase an item from a brand, take it apart, make a pattern from it, make an item from that pattern and then sell it. There's no laws against doing that. However, you can copyright prints, patterns, graphics that appear in fabric. So it seems that Espresso Bug could have claims against them legally because there's a lot of rules around advertising and the things that you use in advertising. I don't know that Espresso Bug has this print copyrighted or has done the work to do that, but I think that they could potentially have a claim against them. Now is the part of the video where I will give my opinions, which may be completely irrelevant because I can't sew. But the reason that I feel so passionately about this topic is because I have met so many Lolitas who have made beautiful pieces using these simplicity patterns and they're absolutely ashamed of it. And I don't think that that's right. I think that they should be proud of the work that they've done. I think that anything you've made to wear with Lolita fashion should be celebrated. That's so cool and creative. Simplicity's parent company is called Conso International Corp. And they also own Vogue patterns, Butterick, New Look patterns, as well as McCall's. And McCall's carries patterns that are collaborations with public figures in different alternative communities, such as Angela Clayton, who is a seamstress and costume maker who specializes in historically inspired ruffly dresses, and the cosplayer Yaya Han. So why not collaborate with Miss Candy Holic or Verge Vampire? I've honestly seen quite a few headpieces that look like this, but it's the fact that we know. We know that Simplicity made this purchase from Miss Candy Holic, and they were not upfront with their intentions when they probably had an idea of why they were buying it, unless it was they thought for personal use that they were gonna wear it, and then later on the company maybe wanted to take that idea. And if that is the case, I still think you could have grabbed a business card and contacted them first. But anyways, even if it isn't illegal, it's still a little bit uncomfortable because Simplicity is a huge corporation coming into this event that houses small brands and you want to make it feel like a safe space for these independent artists, these independent designers and brands. It would also massively benefit Simplicity to have some sort of connection in their patterns to the community. I think that this would greatly validate Lolita consumers knowing that the patterns were vetted by someone who participates in the communities and is someone that they trust. If I could sew, would I use these patterns? I would avoid the accessories one out of respect for those designers and I would maybe just look for other patterns on Etsy that are from smaller designers or I would just purchase accessories made by other people. There's so many options for accessories and in the grand scheme of things they're going to be usually more affordable than a main piece. If you want to boycott the 8444 pattern on grounds to support Espresso Bug and the misuse of their fabric. I totally understand that, but I personally don't think that it's really a conflict of interest for Espresso Bug because they did make their fabric for people to use. So you could make stuff with their fabric and support them by buying their fabric and then using this pattern to make it. The problem I don't think that Espresso Bug hacks is with the consumer making things, as they mentioned in this quote. It seems more that it's the marketing problem. I think that Simplicity could easily fix this by changing the packaging and the marketing for it or by trying to come to some conclusion with Espresso Bug privately, which may have happened. There's just no public information citing that. It is a little suspicious to me that the silhouette of the dresses that were displayed in Simplicity's fashion show in 2015 is 
very different from the patterns that they then released a year later. It is possible that these patterns were stolen from dresses. There's just no evidence to actually back up that claim. So it's possible that Simplicity just learned from being around actual Lolitas and seeing what they wear that they were able to tailor these patterns to suit those needs. It's possible that these dresses were created from the use of buying Lolita fashion pieces and maybe an amalgamation of those because there is no specific dress that it looks like it was copied exactly from. It's up to you though and your comfort, but I don't think that it deserves the hate and shame that it has gotten and I think that the rumors within the Lolita community have blown up around this because they've heard that something was copied, something was stolen, and it just kind of blows out of proportion. As of the time recording this, I think that they're fine to use and you shouldn't be afraid to use them. There is not really a lot of alternative options out there. There is the Otome no Sewing, but it's all in Japanese and there is ways to find it translated. There is of course the GLB patterns, which are in Japanese, you also need to translate it. It kind of seems like of all the patterns out there, these are the most accessible and easy to use. So I don't think that we should perpetuate these rumors and shame against it if they're not confirmed. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any issue with these other patterns, which I will show on screen. So if you want to be safe and avoid any kind of controversy, you could always use these. I feel like I should give a little bit of an opener and more of an explanation of why I chose to talk about this and I don't want it to seem like I'm trying to attack a small business because I'm not. I more so just want to evaluate sort of where this marketing strategy went wrong so that hopefully in the future more businesses avoid these sort of mistakes and also so that content creators and influencers and anyone else who may be doing work like this knows their worth and understands some of the like misleading terms that can be using these sort of pitches. So let's start off by me reading the pitch that I got to be a cult leader. Hi Lore, hope you're well. My name is and I represent an indie sewing pattern brand that creates beginner friendly patterns for cosplay and Japanese inspired street fashion. I wanted to reach out to you because we're in production for a new pattern and apparel collection called Kawaii Cult. And we have a unique launch that we're looking for folks in the Kawaii community to participate in. The collection is five pattern release with all of the patterns based around Japanese street fashion subcultures. The goal for this launch is to cast various folks in the cosplay and J fashion community as cult leaders for each of these styles. Each cult leader will be primary representative for the pattern subculture at launch and will post a handful of in-character photos, videos, stories repping their subculture trying to convince their followers to join them by supporting the merch and pattern for their subculture. Our goal is to create an AR game using social media, primarily Instagram, wherein we cultivate semi-post-apocalyptic world where gangs show dominance through the styles they wear and their disciples, crews, are all recruited online. As such, we'd like to have a contest going at launch where we keep a running tally of which leader has control over all of this fictional world based on which style in the collection has the most sales. We also have gift card and product giveaways from our sponsors that each leader can offer their followers as in-character incentive to join their faction. It's an ambitious launch that, with our current lineup of sponsors and leaders, has an expected reach of over 350,000 people on Instagram. We're very excited to bring on the most creative and positive people in the North American cosplay and J fashion community. I had a few mixed reactions upon reading this because it sounded like a lot of work and that was 
an exciting potential because it could be consistent work for a little while. I was looking at it as sort of an ambassadorship position for this company. But there are a few red flags. I understand why they reached out to me because of my experience with AR games, AR content, which is alternate reality. It is where you make mixed media of different posts and videos and you have ciphers in them that lead to other things. And it's sort of like a puzzle that you put together in different forms of media. And I had experience with this helping out other friends who were running AR games as well as a little bit of experimentation on my own in my Lolita Horror Story series. My concern is with Running a sort of campaign like this where you're pitting alternative fashion against one another is worrying. I know that it's meant to be like a fun fictional kind of game thing and it's like a joke and it's just edgy, but I just think the concept is a little bit lost because I think that alternative communities, we are already different from mainstream fashion and that we should always be trying to support one another and lolitas are constantly fighting against the name and the connotations that it has to vladimir nabokov's novel and people think that we are some sort of weird fetish or kink. so then combining that with throwing the word cult around <laughs> it's like the last thing that we need to connect Lolita fashion too is to also have like search results come up with cults like we do not need that I think that when you're asking people to collaborate on work or to do work for you It's really important to make it clear exactly what you want what you are looking for what you would like and then the compensation that you are willing to offer like that's just just be open and transparent and upfront and honest about it and this email is a little bit deceiving in that department because it doesn't mention any sort of compensation it vaguely mentions the amount of work that they are looking for and that they have an expected reach of over 350,000 people and what that actually means is that the combination of their sponsors following and then the people who are participating, the leaders in this situation, they're following as well. So it's not like you're working for one large company. It's kind of like you're using each other's exposure. And then it sort of felt like if you take me into this situation, are you just using me so that the next person you email, you can say, oh, we have a reach of over 400,000. <laughs> people it's just a little bit I don't know it's a bit yucky to me to be honest so I replied because I thought this could be potential work for me and maybe I can talk to them about my comfort levels with you know pitching my subculture pitching my brand as like a cult and a leader and being against people like I didn't really like that but you know I was like maybe I could tailor my character to be like like ditzy and, and lovey-dovey and more like you know, trying to just bring us all together, like maybe that could be my gimmick or something. I replied to them stating my experience with AR games and asking what the compensation was, what the exact deliverables they were looking for were in the ways of the content that they wanted me to make, what their timeline was for this, and just kind of any expectations that they had for their Kawaii leaders. Thanks for getting back to us so quickly. I'd be happy to answer your questions. The five subcultures we are releasing patterns for are Menhera, Fairy K, Larm, Mori K, and Kyaru Gal. We're asking each leader to take a few photos or mini videos modeling the look in character, making a pitch for why you should join your cult. In terms of commitment, we want to keep it tailored to your unique comfort level and schedule, we'd like each leader to share three to five little posts or videos during the first two weeks of the Kawaii Cult's launch. As the leader, promoting their subculture, hyping it up, responding to other leaders, etc. Overarching goal is just to collaborate with some really great folks from the community and help spread awareness and expression of these subcultures to a broader audience. If any of our leaders would like to contribute accessories or makeup looks, do live streams as their character or add their own characterization and flair in any way, that's totally welcome. But it's not required and we want to give everyone as much freedom as possible. 
As this is a collaborative project and not a sponsorship, there is no fiscal compensation for each leader, but instead cross-promotion exposure through platforms of our other leaders plus business sponsors. As I said, we're forecasting a very broad audience, all with interest in cosplay and J fashion and we're asking that each leader and sponsor tag and promote all the individuals participating in the launch so everyone gets an equal amount of awareness I then replied with a very copy and paste answer that was basically saying that I didn't have time for unpaid work which was true um, but just the way that they had been speaking throughout these emails like left kind of a sour taste in my mouth and I'm assuming other people felt that way as well because at launch there was a very small group of people and it went down very very poorly and I don't exactly remember and I cannot find images or posts from it because they deleted their social media. <laughs> I'm always open to working with independent brands and like indie designers for very little compensation or no compensation just like product because if it's relevant to the leader community if it's within my niche and it needs support i'm very happy to do that there has to be kind of an understanding and respect there and also i just felt like they were demanding a lot i know that they were saying you know work within your schedule just make as much as you're willing to make but at the same time there's also this underlying competition so you want to make more sales so then it kind of looks bad on you from a working standpoint if you participate in this and you're not doing as well. Like other brands could see that and then kind of hold it against you. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. It was strange that they also didn't mention Lolita at all in the subcultures that they were releasing, but they did have Lolita patterns. So maybe that was just a mistake or maybe they just didn't include it because they were assuming that I would be the Lolita cult leader. This launch is also sort of strange to try to grab a broader reach because it's taking a niche and then making more of a niche. You've got to start with sort of a plain base so that you can grab a wider audience so that they can see themselves in this pattern. They can see their own way of how they want to make it. I really cannot tell from these photos how good the pattern is, what the dress is like because there's, it just looks so, <laughs> this looks so bad. I'm so sorry. I don't know. <laughs> you just can't see that it's Lolita. There seems to be a severe disconnect between the illustration and then the product that's being modeled. I consulted with some friends who are educated in fashion design and fashion production and had them analyze this for me and they all sort of said the same thing that they can't truly analyze it because there is no images of the pattern itself but the materials used in this don't seem correct and just the way that it's modeled you cannot really see the silhouette of it which is the most important thing in Lolita fashion and I get that they're trying to do this alternative style of Lolita fashion but Lolita fashion is already alternative. <laughs> I don't want to criticize this model because they're doing a great job of modeling clothes that are not Lolita but they're very much missing the mark for modeling Lolita. <laughs> it's not showing the silhouette, the shape of it correctly. There's ways to pose that are better suited to the style. And when I see people modeling Lolita fashion like this, like without a petticoat in these sort of poses that are scrunching up the dress, hiding the dress, this might sound dramatic, but it feels like a big f you. Like, I don't care about your style. I don't care about your fashion, which is not going to attract Lolitas. I think that that can totally be reclaimed if you want to do that. Like, I've done sort of an edgier photo shoot like that. If you want to be like a rebellious Lolita, I see that. But I feel like there's still a way to do it while respecting the fashion. I think that in order to properly market this pattern, you need to have someone standing with a petticoat with a more traditional Lolita coordinate to be able to see it properly. I didn't want to share this story to cancel them or to attack them in any way. I just really wanted them to take this constructive criticism and anyone else who is making 
products for the Lolita community to sort of understand these things. I found one neutral review of this pattern brand on Tumblr, but there is not a lot of reviews of the actual patterns themselves. And I would love to see them in different ways and like trying to be more authentic to their subculture. This is honestly a project that I think would be great for Sarah Spaceman, but I don't know if she would be interested in doing that. I feel like there is a potential to save this brand and maybe Sarah Spaceman can do that. I can't because I can't sew. The closest thing I have to a cult is my Patreon. <laughs> You can join it at any level. There's bonus videos there. I have a discord server for my patrons above my first tier. We have a lot of fun. My personality is really not suited for being a cult leader. Like I cannot take the pressures of multiple people relying on me. That scares me so much. <laughs> I forgot to put my rings back on. Ah! And the fabric is really adorable. It's called Candy Macaron Shop my dyslexia oh my gosh can't macaron candy and they also own wow that sounded so canadian own okay you saw that i didn't wind that up I didn't wind that up right. I was sitting here trying to light candles this whole- anyways. <laughs>